Um, I, Tarleton, Tarleton has been doing some really cool things, and God has been moving in a really cool way, not only in this ministry, but several of the ministries here um, since 2010 and beyond. And there are people all over the world that have their roots in something that God did at Tarleton, or during their time at Tarleton. Um, and so I, I hope that you feel both a sense of urgency and a sense of like responsibility as you walk here. And so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about several different things, um, but I, I just want you to know that there are, God has done some really cool things in the past, and because I believe in a God that doesn't change tomorrow, today, or yesterday, like God is never changing, that means God is still at work on campus and still at work in you guys too. And so I'm honored tonight to be a part, like on a Thursday night, just to be one of the, one of the things that God is at work in today. And so we're going to be continuing stuff. Real quickly, I want to introduce my family. I think there's a picture up there. Maybe. Hey, there we are. Um, so that's me. That's, I'm Warren. It's nice to meet you guys. This is my wife, Sarah, um, and this is our daughter, Rin. Um, Rin is, turns three in December, and we've got a baby boy come in right the week after Christmas named Ben. And so Rin and Ben keep us really busy. My daughter has a chocolate milk problem, but we're praying through it. Uh, they don't offer rehab facilities for chocolate milk for some reason. Uh, we're still wondering about that. Maybe we should open up our own, but here we are. Um, and I need to apologize to you, and, like, the first one's going to be ridiculous because that's, like, where we're at already. But um, I've got three apologies. One, I'm super excited, um, so I need to apologize for that already. You can tell I'm up here. We're going to have to bring it down here pretty quick. Um, two, I... We had a funeral out of state last week for my wife's family, um, and then I got sick as soon as we got back, and so I haven't seen people that I wasn't somehow related to in over eight days, and so just being with you, I'm already really excited, and so once again, we'll bring that down a little bit. And then last but not least, three, the things that we're talking about tonight, when times get rough, you guys have been sitting and chilling in that, marinating in it for three weeks, um, and I've been preparing this lesson for a couple weeks. These, uh, this is one of those hard lessons that God is still teaching me at the same time. And so like, I'm going to be all over the map. Um, excitement, emotional, because these are, there's some raw things. Um, when we talk about difficult seasons and what the Lord is doing in them. And so we find ourselves kind of once again in there tonight. And the reason that it's so important is because for those of us who believe in God and, and non-believe people that are, do not have any kind of like, you've never, church is not your thing. Like Jesus, you're like, I don't know who that is. Or maybe like I've heard of who that is, or I've started coming around to this thing. I just don't know what I think about it. All are welcome here because we all live on a broken planet Earth, and we can watch the news and know that the world's jacked up just a little bit, right? Yeah, nods. If someone's like, no, the world's perfect, I'm like, hey, we need to have a conversation afterward, and let's talk about that. Okay, but um, like, we all know that the world's broken, and so no matter where you fall on the I'm religious or I'm spiritual section of life, we will all endure hardships, and we will all find difficult moments in our life. And so the weightiness of what we're talking about tonight weighs on me, and I feel the responsibility of that. And so let's keep rolling, okay? Um, because the reality of it is Jesus promised that we'll struggle. But before we jump into that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then we're going to hit the ground running. And yes, this is the speed I'm going to talk all night, okay? So let's do it, okay? So let's pray. God, thank you so much for this, this evening where we get to sit with your word then we get to sit and read a letter from Peter to the early church, the early followers of you who found themselves in a really hard situation. God, I pray that you would speak in a really clear and powerful way tonight. God, give us ears to hear. I pray for myself um, that you would have me say nothing more or nothing less than you, what you've asked. I pray for those of us that are here, um, just that distraction would be put to the side. And Lord, we would fully transparent um, sit before you tonight. We just pray all these things in your name. Amen. So one thing that's going to be a little different tonight, we're going to cover a huge chunk of scripture, okay? So we're going to hang out in First Peter tonight. Um, I'm going to reference several scriptures kind of all over the place. We're going to hit a couple of larger chunks of scripture kind of in First Peter 1 and First Peter 2 at the very end. Um, and have no fear, we're going to cover a lot of verses right at first. We're going to talk about two points in there and then follow up in chapter two with the third point there, okay? So when you're like, good grief, he's read like 23 something verses, don't worry. Like we've timed it, it's going to be okay, okay? Um, but the reality is Jesus promises that there will be suffering, okay? He does it multiple times throughout scripture, but two times in particular. Um, if you're new to the Bible, like you've got these two sections, you've got the Old Testament, which is God look, creating everything. We know this, a lot of us know that story. Then looking down and making a covenant with Israel saying, if you will be my people, I will be your God. And as long as you have no other gods before me, I will be with you to the ends of the age. I will be a blessing 
through you to the rest of the world. And so what Israel does is looks up and says, that sounds like a great idea. And then they go off and worship every single God they can. And like, and so, and God, even though he owes them nothing, and even though he, like, there's no, like, God does not get anything from being with Israel. Um, he continually pursues an, an Israel that continues to run to everything except him and brings them closer to him. Now that culminates when you get to the New Testament, which are four different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of Jesus, who was fully God, fully man, coming off his throne of heaven, living a perfect life, because um, he was fully God, basically modeling for everybody else what does it look like to live the perfect life. But not only that, that ultimate pursuit of a, a people that were running away, Jesus dies and sacrificed himself for the imperfection of God's people. And then not only is that invitation uh, acceptable to Israel to be a part of God's people, but through Jesus' death and then resurrection, because death could not hold him back because he's God, because he's perfect. Through his resurrection, he offers an invitation to everyone outside the people of Israel as well to be a part of the family of God. And so then the rest of the New Testament, which is where we're going to be hanging out in Peter today, the rest of the New Testament after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is everyone going, this is how we live a life based on what Jesus did and said, both as individuals and then also as the people of God, the early church, okay? And so we find ourselves at the back of the Bible in 1 Peter, Peter being like the guy, one of Jesus' main bros, one of the main disciples, where he, like, we know Jesus because he stuck his foot in his mouth a lot. There are moments, like really sweet moments, like in Mark 9, where Peter is like, uh, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Who do the people say that I am? And Peter's the one that answers, we believe that you're the son of God, the Messiah. And he says, blessed are you, Peter, for you could not have known this on your own. That's my summary of it. And then the next paragraph, um, Jesus like talks to these people and he's like, yes, like I, he says some pretty gruesome things. Um, like he is going to tear down the temple and it be rebuilt in three days, which he was talking about himself, the place where people worship. And Peter, who just said, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God, the savior of us all, takes him to the side and goes, Hey, bro, you shouldn't talk like that. I don't know if that's a good idea. Which we all, like, in hindsight, we can be like, that's dumb. Why would he do that? This is the same Peter, okay? Much later in life, much wiser, because we all hope we get wiser as we get older, right? Much wiser, but then also a leader of this new group of people who are following Jesus and the things that he said, the early church, okay? So we get to 1 Peter We've been talking about when times get rough. I know two weeks ago that Ben taught you guys over Elisha and how God is continually at work and the hope that comes with that. Daniel taught last week on Job, man, a hard lesson, and the reverence and humility we should have as we approach God, even when we don't fully understand what is happening. But then tonight, we're looking at a completely different thing. We're doing something different because we're not looking just at a person who is having a rough, a difficult season or a rough time, but we're looking at a letter written to a whole group of people who are suffering together. Okay, Peter's the writer of this letter, and the audience is a bunch of different people. And so before we even jump into the scripture, let's talk about the context of it, okay? First Peter, the letter from Peter to the church, is written about 62 to 65 AD, okay? Jesus dies somewhere in 30 to 33 AD, so this has happened about 30 years afterwards. Um, this is a really tumultuous time. You can look in 1 Peter 1. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed, abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. These are people that are exiled. These are people that are spread out. Okay, These are people that are living in places where it is not safe for them to live. A lot of them in the vicinity of Rome, Okay, the mega power of the day. Okay, So he's writing to these people. The reason that that 62 to 65 AD is important, because in 64, something hits the fan in Rome. 64 AD, there is a massive fire. You can look this up. Massive fire in Rome. Emperor Nero is the guy on the throne. Emperor Nero, bad dude, okay? Emperor Nero, he has this massive fire. It burns for six days and seven nights, okay? Burns 70% of Rome. 70%. Rome's big. 70% is a lot. A lot of people died. A lot of, the, a lot of Rome is in shambles, burning cinders, okay? So the people needed someone to blame, and they blamed Emperor Nero. Now, there is some, like, evidence that some people think that Nero set the fire himself so he could rebuild parts of Rome, uh, but to avoid, like, the criticism and the assassination attempts and the other things that come with being in power, um, people started to accuse him, whether he did it or not. He turned... And he blamed a new group of up-and-comers that were gaining momentum in, like, in the undercurrents of Rome. He looked at Christians and said it was the Christians' fault. They did it. Because, this is in my notes, we don't need to talk about it, because one of the most threatening things for people in power, in positions of power, is to have a group of people that say they serve a higher calling than them. 
So when people or religious people are like leaders of, of civilizations are looking for people to blame, it is very easy to point to the Christians or the believers in, in a deity or a God and say, it's their fault, let's take them out. Because they're the biggest threat, okay? No, I do not want to join the Wi-Fi. Okay, so um, burns for six days, seven nights. He blames the Christian, um, and that be makes the Christian faith majorly persecuted. And we're not just talking about they didn't get jobs, okay? Um, that's the thing that we kind of say in America, like, oh, man, he graded my test harder than everybody else. I am persecuted. That's true. That is persecution because we don't have a harder word in the English language for what these guys experience. Um, and so instead of, like, trying to summarize it, I'm going to read to you a Roman historian. This is not Christian. This is secular. It was written several years after this event. It's by Tacitus. I looked up how to say that word, so be proud of me. Tacitus said this, okay? Therefore, to stop the rumor that he had set Rome on fire, the emperor Nero falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful torture the persons commonly called Christians, who were generally hated for their enormities. First, those were arrested who confessed they were Christians. Next, on their information, a vast multitude was convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of the charge of hating the human race. In their very deaths, they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses like their savior, or set fire to, and when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. So, just real quickly in case you missed that. Nero said, these guys are irresponsible, and he drummed up all this information that made everybody around them hate them. Okay, he said, man, these are the guys that don't want you. They hate humanity. They hate everything we stand for. Look, their savior calls them to something different. Like, they, they can't, they can't, we can't stand them. They're not a part of us anymore. And so he rounded up the people he knew were Christians and arrested them. Okay, probably some of them turned themselves over willingly. And then they were tortured to give up names of other Christians, and they were arrested them. And then he tortured them so severely, he nailed them to crosses like Jesus. He's like, if you want to die like your Savior, here you go. Then he covered them with meat and sicked the wild dogs of the city on them, made them run through the streets, made it a big sport, okay? Um, and we're going to get a little gruesome here for a second, okay? Then he would set people on fire. Burning at the stake was not out of the ordinary right now, but he made Christians the target so severely of the persecution that at night they would hang them to serve as the city lights, okay? These are the people that believe the same thing. If you are a follower of Christ, the only thing they were convicted of is the same thing that we sit here and talk about tonight. The severity. The flip side, the freedom that we have should not be missed, okay? So all that said, we get to First Peter, who is writing to these guys. The guys that are being hunted, the guys that are meeting in secret, the guys who are watching if I can be gruesome, watching their friends burn. And we find ourselves in 1 Peter 3, or 1 Peter chapter 1, okay? And we're going to, like I said, we're going to read a pretty big chunk here. So 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Did you catch that? He's writing to a people who are watching their lives being burned before them. And he says, you, are, you have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded, guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire. Whoa is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see why context is so important? Peter just wrote to these guys and says, I see you. I know what's happening. This is where your hope is at. We're going to talk about this in a second, but you know that what was not in any of there? One of the things that was not in any of that passage was, it's going to be easy. You will live. Don't notice that? He talked about the hope of things that are coming, not the current. We're going to skip to verse 13 because 10, like all the things that we're jumping over are really great, but to, to 
suffice it down so we're not reading two chapters of scripture. We're going to skip to 13, okay? Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And then we're going to skip down to verse 22. Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that, you shown, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fail, fall, falls, excuse me, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. Do you hear Peter highlight the short term of life? For a people that were faced with persecution and death was on their doorstep, he highlights the, the, the finiteness of it all, Okay. And then he points them to more eternal significance. Where is their hope found? Which brings us to our first question. Okay, so we already pointed out Peter never promises ease or relief, which brings us to our first question tonight. Where is your hope found? Okay, because there's some really interesting things about pain. Because Jesus already promises that we're going to suffer. Jesus promises, maybe not to this level, okay, not in America anyway. A lot of our brothers and sisters across the world face this right now, like today. Um, all, and not just the places you're hearing the news, okay, but like all the time. And I need you to know, like, even though like Christianity is illegal in many countries, including China, the movement of, like, God has not stopped because laws exist. And so, like, even through, like, First Peter, when persecution, even in this time that we're talking about with Emperor Nero, the Christian church grew astronomically in the midst of this persecution, okay? Because pain has a, a way of doing a couple different things. Um, like, pain, pain makes us really quickly evaluate um, what's really important to us, okay? It's also a great BS remover, because some of, I mean, some of us, like, we, we focus on empty platitudes that aren't really in the Bible. And I'm just going to throw out one there. Uh, but, like, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness and stuff like that. That doesn't hold up nearly as well when someone's trying to be down your door to get to you. Okay? That is not something that the early church that Peter is writing to was worried about. Okay? Um, they also weren't concerned with, um, like, quotes that weren't in the Bible at all. So, like, live your best life now, uh, or if you name it, you can claim it, different things like that. Like, the church that we're looking at in the Bible, like, was not wrestling with whether or not that was true. Because they were being hunted. Nobody said, name it, claim it, I want someone to come to my house. But that's the reality they were facing, right? And so pain operates as the great BS remover for our life. And so because of that, the Christian church was growing astronomically. But where is our hope found? That's the first question. And we can find it in several different verses. So verse 4, um, he says, Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. What's he talking about there? Verse 8 and 9, we see it again. You have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And then we see it again at the very end of what we talked about, 24 and 25. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass wither and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And the word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. Okay? So what is that word, like gospel? Like the, the, we know what it is. We've heard it from stage a million times. But the reality is when they said gospel, we don't have a word for that in English. What it translates as is good news. Okay? And it's a good news that's different from any other good news. Now we know okay, that all of us are imperfect people. We all have sin in our life, which is just imperfection. It stands at like contrast to who God is in his character. And so because of that, we're separated from God. Now, throughout scripture, when something sin or when something is imperfect, something has to die, okay? And so you can see it in the very beginning of Genesis, an animal dies, produce covering for Adam and Eve. And we see that continue over and over and over, Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice for all of those things. Because he lived a perfect life, like he can be the, the sacrifice that covers. And through that invitation, it's, it, he presents it as a perfect gift, Romans 3, uh, 6.23 says. But the problem with the gift, not the problem, but the problem with the gift is even if I go and pay for something, I've got a younger brother, he's two years younger than me, also went to Tarleton. Um, if I got my brother a birthday gift and I set it on the table and I even paid the extra money because I'm bougie and get like wrapped at the store and I set it on the table and I put it on his card, it's like, no, then, you know, and I put it there. If, if he never accepts that gift, if he never takes it, 
Yes, I purchased it. Yes, I paid the money that was needed. Yes, I provided it. But my brother never accepted it. Okay? It's the greatest act of love is to say, hey, I've done this for you, but whether or not you want it is up to you. Okay? And so what the gospel is, it's a message that it doesn't matter. Um, where, like, it doesn't matter what our circumstances or what we've done. We can never Un, or we can never erase our imperfection, Jesus comes and takes the place for us. And he says, I will take on his imperfection so that he can have a relationship with God and be presented as perfect through me. No longer is he Warren Etheridge. He is a son of God. He's a part of the kingdom. And that invitation is to each and every one of us. Because the reality is of a God who created the whole universe, he knows you better than you know yourself. And so for those of us that sit and go, God can never understand the darkness of my life. Oh, he does way better than you do right? And so each one of us has an invitation, an open invitation to that, um, where Jesus stands and waits and says, here is what I've done for you. Would you like to be a part of it? What a cool invitation, right? But here's the flip side of that. If that's the reality and that's the story, if that's the good news, as they would say in that time, right? If that's the gospel, that means our hope is not in the circumstances we find ourselves in right now. Paul was quoted. Paul is this, uh, another one of these like, early church planners. He was all over the world. He would tell people he'd get arrested all the time because he was a little bit loudmouthy about who Jesus was in a good way, okay? But people in power don't like that. When they say, hey, there's a power greater than you, they're like, uh, no way. You still got to pay taxes. And they throw him in jail all the time, okay? And so Paul would find himself in places where his life was at risk. And he said, to live is for Christ. Like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to share the gospel all over the place. If I die, it's gain. Like, there's nothing you can do to me. If I die, it's, it's gain. I go to heaven. I like reap the benefit of my reward. All these things that Peter writes to this church about, it's, you win, right? But pain is still real. We still find ourselves in rough times. And so the reality is pain is a really good reality check for where our hope is really found. Do we have it placed in temporary things? And I'm going to call some things out, okay? And most of them are from my own life. And I know that so many of us, because we're all like in the college realm right now, we're going to identify with. I do not know your life. I'm not reading your journal, okay? But some of us put our hope in our job, present or future, okay? Through that, some of us put our hope in the money that we're going to make. I mean, if I can just make this amount of money, I'm not worried about health problems, okay? When you have kids, it's even more significant. And you're like, man, if I have make this much money, if... Rent. My daughter, I told you she had a chocolate milk problem. She's also in a jumping phase, which is scary as a father. She's just like, kid does not know her boundaries. And so she's like, daddy, I'm going to jump off the bed. And I'm like, which one? And she's like, mom, I'm like, that thing's hot. No. And like, I'd like come in and she's like getting ready to like free fall. <laughs> I don't have the kind of budget to keep up with that. Okay. Nor the insurance. Let's be real. So there's always going to be an amount of money that makes us feel safe. Or so we think. Some of us put our, uh, ooh, uh, no, this is from my own life, I can say that. Some of us put our, our hope in our grades. Or maybe at the root of it, some of us put our hope in our achievement. And we say, if I can just be perceived as this way, I'll be safe. Or maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit more sinister that if I can only be perceived this way, people will come alongside me, people will help me out, people will think of me so well, blah, 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 blah. Nothing bad could happen, right? The flip side of that, some of us, um, put our hope in our, our parents. Some of us put our hope in our spouse or relationship, which is, that's a roller coaster. My goodness, you want to hit your trailer up to that. Okay. Uh, we can't talk about relationships right now. It'd take too long. But we connect ourselves to all the, and some of them are material. Like sometimes, like our car, like our thing. I don't want to throw things out because I, I don't know you, but I don't know your life. But sometimes we put our, our hope and trust in some kind of physical thing, like a car or a position or a person or uh, a build a house. Okay, I'm coming from an adult perspective here. Um, we put our hope in those things and they will always let us down. Okay, they're temporary. But the reality is when things start to hurt, we find out really quickly what it is um, that we actually have our hope in. And for a lot of us, even for those of us that say we follow Christ, our real hope's not in that. It's in something less, it's something more tangible, okay? So I love this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. She was talking about women um, and like in a very intricate time where uh, like different things were being decided about women's role in society and different things like that. And I love this quote. She said, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water, Okay. Now, the reason I post that up there is it's not until we get in tough, hot situations where what's inside comes out, 
Okay, we all know that. We've seen all the kids' shows that, like, that's the punchline at the very end, um, but that's the reality of it, okay? James 1, 2 through 4 um, says something a little bit similar, too. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So, guys, from that, testing produces endurance. And not testing like Okim testing. Like, we're talking testing as far as, like, I mean, you were in a difficult season of life. For some of you, you're like, that's the same thing, bro. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, and I hear you. I see you. I got you, okay? But for a lot of us, like, our life situations, those are the various trials, the temptations, the, the testing um, that leads to that endurance and how to endure that, okay? But this is the key thing, and it says it in four. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Guys, through the more, the testing and surviving those things, it produces the endurance where we can be more mature, where we can be walking closer to the Lord, where we can know the Lord better. C.S. Lewis said it this way. Um, he wrote a book completely on pain and our response to it. It said, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So guys, what is our hope in? Is it in something temporary or is it something eternal and unchanging? But guys, in the meantime, like the question we have to ask is what are we doing? Like trials are happening, tough situations, rough situations are happening all the time. What are we doing in the meantime? Because I think if we're, if we're not careful, we'll fall into a ditch and be paralyzed by the situation around us and curl up into the, metaphorically, some of us really, but metaphorically, curl up into the fetal position and not do anything. But read 13 through 16 right here. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be so reminded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Guys, we don't go back to our old ways. 22, since you have been purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincerely brotherly love for each other from a pure heart to love one another constantly because you have been born again. Guys, so many of us curl into the fetal position position and we're like God like what does God want from me I don't even know because like we're like looking for a burning bush somewhere where we can hear James Earl Jones like the voice of Darth Vader and the voice of like uh, Mufasa like remember who you are you know it's like we're looking we're looking for a cloud in the sky and for God to like tell us in a, a resounding voice like move on to the next thing you know something like that when the reality is the things that God wants us to remember like the things that are really important he wrote down He's already spoken, okay? But we stopped doing those things as soon as it got difficult. And they're the very things that we needed to survive the tough situation we were in. Because reality is, the tough situation did not take God by surprise. And he's been trying to prepare us the whole time, okay? So I want to introduce this, this idea of actively waiting, okay? One of my seniors at TCU said this as she like addressed our group, our leadership team. Um, and she's, it's just doing the things that God has asked to do while waiting for him to tell us what's next or what to do next. So the questions we need to ask, are we loving one another constantly? Are we sharing the reason for the hope that we have? Are we making disciples and equipping people behind us with everything we know? Are we loving our enemies? Are we recognizing where we fall short? Are we loving those who oppose us? Because the next question is how do we treat each, like how do we treat other people in these rough times? Okay, so this is the last scripture we're looking at, and then we'll be done. But look at 1 Peter 2. I could have chosen a bunch of different scriptures throughout here. Like, I, there's a lot of different things we could have looked at, but I specifically wanted to look at through 17, okay? Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors as those sent on, out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Remember, this is written to a people who are being hunted by the emperor. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Thank you for watching this video from the Tarleton BSM. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments below or contact us at www.tarletonbsm.com. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Tarleton BSM.